Okay, we're now going to move on to the patellofemoral joint. Uh, this is a self-assessment -assess exam question. Uh, figure 10, which you see here, uh, shows patellar radiographs of a 68-year-old woman who underwent bilateral knee arthroplasty two months prior to this x-ray. She had a recent fall onto the left knee, now has anterior knee pain. A CT scan was obtained, which shows the femoral and tibial components are appropriately externally rotated, and the radiographs show acceptable axial alignment of the tibial femoral components with no ever evidence of loosening of any of the three components. What is the appro most appropriate treatment option? Are you going to go ahead and fix that medial marginal patellar fracture that you see? Are you going to do a lateral release with a proximal realignment? Are you going to revise the tibia? Are you going to do a distal realignment through medialization of the tibial tubercle? Or are you going to revise the patellar component? Well, here the correct answer is to do a lateral release to correct that lateral patellar subluxation and typically do a medial proximal imbrication realignment. Again, <clears throat> there's uh, typically these peripheral marginal fractures of the tibia that do not affect loss of the extensor mechanism, like the quad tendon, do not uh, affect the fixation of the patellar component. These will either heal or usually they don't cause a problem. You certainly don't want to revise the tibial component when it's well aligned axially and rotationally. Wouldn't recommend a distal realignment. There are certainly more complications associated with doing a tibial tubercle osteotomy and transfer. And I don't think there's any reason to revise the patellar component because it is still well fixed. And sometimes in situations like these, if patients have a fall uh, early on after knee arthroplasty, when you open the knee, they may have a dis dehiscence of the arthrotomy and simply maybe a little lateral release with repair of an arthrotomy dehiscence will solve your problem. Uh, we've already mentioned earlier on that abnormal patellar tracking is a common complication of total knee arthroplasty. And certainly the most important variable in assuring proper patellar tracking is preservation of the Q angle. And this again is defined as the ankle or the angle created from the axis of the extensor mechanism, anterior superiliac spine to the center of the patella versus the axis of the patellar tendon, center of the patella to the tibial tuberosity. If you increase the Q angle, Again, this increases the lateral force vector and increases the risk of lateral patellar subluxation and the subsequent mechanical problems that we have already talked about. So it is, again, critical to avoid techniques that increase Q angle. And I'm again re-mentioning these as they, they have been hot on a lot of the self-assessment examinations. So you're going to increase the Q angle and, and risk lateral patellar subluxation if you internally rotate or medialize the femoral, femoral component, internally rotate or medialize the tibial component, or you place the patellar button more lateral on the patella. And here, I'm going to go through each one of these in more detail, but to diagrammatically show if you internally rotate the femoral component, you are essentially taking the trochlea further medial, making patellofemoral capture more difficult. If you medialize the femoral component, the same thing happens. You're bringing the trochlear groove medial aware, away from where the patella wants to track. If you laterally shift the patella, you are essentially moving it away from the trochlea. And if you internally rotate the tibial tubercle or a correction. If you internally rotate your tibial component, you are actually lateralizing relatively your tibial tubercle. Same thing happens if you medialize the tibial tri or the tibial component on the tibia, you get a relative lateralization of the tibial tubercle, an increased Q angle, 
increased lateral force vector and subsequent increased risk of lateral patellar tracking. So another question, malrotation of total knee components leading to patellar tracking is best diagnosed by what radiographic modality? You get the typical three joint standing x-rays, a dynamic examination under anesthesia with fluoro, a CT scan of the knee, the 45 degree flex PA view or that Rosen view, Rosenberg standing tunnel or an MRI of the knee? Well, the answer is a CT scan. And the CT scan is very, very helpful in going ahead and assessing rotational position of both the femoral and tibial components. Here you can see in the uh, insert on your right, and this was a patient that had both knee stiffness and lateral tracking of the patella. And here you can see that the femoral component is internally rotated relative to the trans epicondylar axis. And ideally, you would like to have your femoral component placed parallel with the epicondylar line. Remember, when we're looking at how to go ahead and rotate that femoral component properly, there are three typical bone landmarks that are used. One is the anterior posterior axis, or what is uh, uh, called Leo's line or Whiteside's line, as he has described this. This is an axis that runs from the center of the trochlear groove to the center of the intercomolar notch. And most commonly, this line will be perpendicular to the trans epicondylar axis. If we look at the trans epicondylar axis, this is obviously a line defined running from the medial to the lateral epicondyles. And in most knees, it will be parallel to the cut surface of your tibia. A posterior femoral cut parallel to the epicondylar line will in most cases give you that rectangular flexion gap that you desire. The posterior condylar axis is the line running across the posteriormost aspects of the two posterior condyles. And most of the time, this line is about three degrees internally rotated relative to the transepicondylar axis. So therefore, when you are placing that AP cutting block, you would like to place it three degrees externally rotated to the posterior condylar line. Remember, however, if you have that valgus knee where the lateral femoral condyle is hypoplastic or worn posteriorly, use of this axis will lead to internal rotation of the femoral component. And I add this additional warning. While the average posterior condylar twist angle, which is that angle between the posterior condylar line and the epicondylar line, the average is three to four degrees of external rotation. But if we look at the, the work of Mantis and Insol, the range is one to 10 degrees. Therefore, to cut everybody at three degrees of external rotation is not wise. Should you have a patient that has a poster condylar twist angle of seven degrees and you cut them at three degrees, you will essentially be internally rotating your femoral component four degrees. So again, I think it is wise to vary the angle of femoral component rotation based on the anatomic variances of femoral anatomy. Another question on patellofemoral alignment. We've got a 66-year-old woman with genovalgum osteoarthritis. She has a knee replacement. What technical error could lead to postoperative lateral patellar instability? Externally rotating the tibia, externally rotating the femur, internally rotating the femur, lateralizing your femoral component, or medializing your patellar component? Well, the obvious answer, as we've discussed, is internally rotating the femur. External rotation of the femoral and tibial components typically helps 
getting patellofemoral capture, as does a bit of lateralization of your femoral component or medialization of your patellar component. And again, if you internally rotate the femur, you increase the Q angle, you, bra you bring that me the trochlear groove medial away from the, uh, from the patella. And another adverse effect of internally rotating, if you internally rotate your femoral component, you will be under-resecting the poster aspect of your medial femoral condyle. And this will lead to medial flexion gap, tightness in flexion, and a stiff total knee arthroplasty. Medialization of that femoral component will similarly increase the Q angle, making patellofemoral capture more difficult. Therefore, if you have femoral component width that is a bit wider than the diameter of the chosen femoral component, it is usually wise to move the femoral component two or three millimeters laterally as it will make patellofemoral tracking more easy to obtain. Next question, also patellofemoral joint. A standard knee replacement is performed on a 56-year-old female using a spinal anesthetic and the use of a tourniquet. The surgeon had cemented the components and they note that the patella is subluxing laterally during knee flexion. The alignment and axial rotation of all three components is considered perfect. The only problem is the patella is subluxing laterally. What should the surgeon do? Number one, perform a lateral release. Two, revise the tibial component into more external rotation. Three, revise the femoral component in more external rotation. Four, revise the patellar component to a more medial position on the native patella, or reevaluate patellar tracking after you deflate the tourniquet. Well, the answer here is in this situation, you don't want to per immediately perform a lateral release. You don't want to revise components because they're well positioned. And remember that a tourniquet creates a relative tenodesis effect on the extensor mechanism, which can falsely result in lateral patellar subluxation. So you never want to perform a lateral release until you have decompressed the tourniquet. And oftentimes, that lateral patellar subluxation will go away. Now let's talk about the patellofemoral joint in terms of the tibial prosthesis. In general, we want to rotate the tibial tray in a neutral position with no significant internal or external rotation. And the anatomic studies have shown that in most patients, you center the tibial tray over the medial third of the tibial tubercle. This is not the case in all. If you have somebody that has a Q angle of over 15 degrees uh, native, that tibial tubercle may be more lateralized. But for most people, center the tray over the medial third of the tibial tubercle. This may leave a portion of the posterior medial tibia uncovered or a bit of overhang posterolaterally if you use a symmetric tray. Internally rotating the tibia, as I have previously stated, lateralizes the tibial tubercle, increases the Q angle, and increases the risk. Medialization of the tibia will do the same thing. What about the patellar prosthesis? Certainly the preferred position of the patellar prosthesis is to center it over the patella or to medialize it. And I think most surgeons today are routinely medializing the patellar component. It makes it easier to gain patellofemoral uh, uh, capture. One of the problems, if you are using a circular button and you medialize, as this diagram shows, it leads to exposed bone of the lateral facet. And remember, that exposed bone is innervated bone. 
and you can result in lateral facet syndrome with chronic lateral facet pain in this situation. And whenever I have this situation, I routinely go ahead and remove any exposed lateral bone to lessen the risk of lateral facet pain. Another alternative, there are a number of companies that have come out with oval-shaped patellar buttons that actually fit the oval shape of the native patella and actually have the apex of the button medialized so you don't have to do much shifting. Remember, the thing you don't want to do is lateralize the patellar button on the patella. It increases Q angle and the risk of patellar tracking. Also, again, just to mention, as this has been a hot one on some of the exams, if you have lateral subluxation intraoperatively, don't do the lateral release until you have deflated the tourniquet. I'll just briefly mention the issue of resurfacing. Uh, this is controversial uh, in America. The majority of patellae are resurfaced, but if you go to Europe and Asia, often the majority are not resurfaced. I think what most people would agree on uh, as far as if you, if you do uh, believe in unresurfacing, you probably still want to resurface in inflammatory arthritis such as rheumatoid arthritis if you can't get the native patella to track properly or if you have substantial patellofemoral arthritis as the main presenting indication for tonally arthroplasty. Certainly your options are to resurface everyone, selectively resurface, or never resurface. And most of the people that are doing a high percentage of not resurfacing, they often do a patelloplasty where they resect any marginal osteophytes to kind of reshape the patella. And certainly a number of the Europeans often do a cauterization procedure where they will cauterize trying to denervate the patella to lessen pain. I have read articles that this is helpful and in others that does not make a difference, commonly used in Europe. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.